MSI is one of the leading brands when it comes to high performance computer hardware, creating many of the world's most powerful and advanced motherboards, graphics cards, CPU coolers, and much more. However, today we're keeping our focus purely on their motherboards with the release of the mighty Z790 Tomahawk Wi-Fi DDR4. I'm a big fan of the Tomahawk series too, albeit I usually buy one of the B series boards, but it's great to see a more high-end Z series Tomahawk board in our office. But before we get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. Hello mate, you all right? Yeah, just got all the bits from my banging new gaming PC. Just got to put it together. It's going to be so much better than yours. Oh, right. What did you get then? The latest Intel 12th gen processor, a feature packed motherboard and 32 gig of DDR4 memory. See, miles ahead of yours. <laughs> you, you realize that board needs DDR5 memory, don't you? Don't tell me you went and bought the wrong stuff. DDR4 is so 2014. I can't believe you was that stupid. <sighs> what? No, you're joking. What should I get then? For me, I'd be looking at Corsair's newest Vengeance DDR5 kits, or if you're wanting that all important RGB, then go for the Dominator Platinum RGB. Oh, you are a lifesaver, thanks. But where can I find out more? By clicking the link in the description below, of course. <laughs> you call me the stupid one. So the MSI Z790 Tomahawk Wi-Fi DDR4. Though it's not one of the top tier boards, instead being part of the Mag series, it's still very well equipped, featuring support for both the latest 12th and 13th generation Intel CPUs, which should also get the performance boost they need thanks to a comprehensive 16 plus one plus one power design. So pushing big boost clocks or overclocks should be fairly easy. Of course, you do get some robust heat sinks too, helping to cool down those VRMs, the chipset, and the M.2 slots to ensure that performance can be sustained. Fast not enough, you also get the latest PCI Express 5.0 technology, four Lightning Gen 4 M.2 slots, and USB 3.2 Gen 2x2, as well as both Intel 2.5G LAN and Wi-Fi 6E. Should also be noted that this motherboard comes in both DDR4 and DDR5 variants, and we have the more affordable DDR4 version at our disposal today. So let's start with the packaging. The box is really nicely designed and follows the aesthetic we've seen on previous Tomahawk products, playing on the Tomahawk missile theme and a more kind of industrial military look. It's a cool box though, and you can see it has the usual Windows 11 support, TPM 2.0 and the Z790 chipset, bringing the latest features to the board. Around the back, there's a really nice breakdown of the overall features with a layout that's actually very similar to how they lay out their BIOS page. You can see the VRM configuration, M.2 technologies, Lightning 20G USB, and much more, telling you really everything that you need to know should you be looking at this in a retail store. I also really appreciate a rear IO map so you can see exactly what's kind of consisted in terms of USB and audio configurations. So what about the design? Well, the overall aesthetic on this motherboard is actually really impressive with a kind of very dark oiled steel look to it that has a almost blue inkiness to the darker greys. It's a very impressive design with lots of large and almost oppressive looking heat sinks around the CPU, with aggressive lines cut through the metal at 45 degrees, matching the overall brushed metal look as well. The two large VRM heat sinks around the CPU are quite deep, and the leftmost one also stretches to go under the rear IO shroud, giving it a very clean and kind of tidy look. There's four more large heat sinks dominating the lower sections of the motherboard, labeled 01 to 04. These are actually the M.2 mounting points. However, there is a fifth heatsink for the chipset too, which just says Tomahawk on it. And along with this, there's also a fully armored X16 PCIe 5.0 slot at the top, an X4 slot in the middle, and a full size slot running at X8 speeds at the bottom. With the heatsinks removed, you can see that the CPU takes advantage of that 16 phase mirrored power arrangement, which features 90 amp chokes. A high quality thermal pad is also applied between the VRM and the heatsinks to help with heat transfer, and everything kind of looks like it means business. The CPU draws power from two 8-pin CPU power connectors for those using more demanding CPUs or to just provide more stable voltages overall should you need it, especially if overclocking. Now, the Tomahawk I'm reviewing is a DDR4 motherboard, so you can likely use your old memory if you're upgraded. However, there is a DDR5 version of this motherboard as well, so be sure to order the one that you really need. The rear IO is pretty plentiful too, with a DisplayPort connector, HDMI, USB 3.2 Gen 1 and Gen 2, and a USB 3.2 Gen 2x2 20 gigabit per second Type-C port. 
Also, thanks to the chipset, we do have 2.5G LAN and Wi-Fi 6E with two antenna connectors, along with 7.1 channel Realtek audio. For troubleshooting, the board also features a clear CMOS button and a BIOS button, which is something we've typically seen on higher end boards. So the thing I've always liked about the Tomahawk Ranger boards is that they tend to harness a lot of the features that higher end boards would normally have, but for a much lower price. Sure, it doesn't have Gen 5 M.2s, but for the price, I couldn't really see anyone spending more on a single storage drive than the motherboard itself. Now, when it comes to testing, it's always a bit of a weird one because with motherboards, they don't give extra performance. So instead, we have to look at where the performance sits in relation to other boards that feature the same chipset. Now, bearing in mind that this is a DDR4 based board, we'd expect it to sit below other Z790 boards that use DDR5 in some tests. Now, speaking of testing, we put the board onto our Z790 based test bench featuring an Intel Core i9-12900K with 32 gig of Corsair Dominator Platinum 3600 MHz memory. While for DDR5 testing, we use the same, but 5200 MHz memory instead. For our storage, we use a Seagate Firecuda 530 1TB NVMe drive to help alleviate any bottlenecks. And our GPU is the Palette RTX 3080 GameRock OC. The processor is kept cool with the NZXT Z73 RGB AIO, and our complete system is all tucked inside the NZXT H7 flow case with all of the side panels closed to simulate real world usage, which in turn helps us test VRM temperatures. The complete system is powered by the NZXT C1000 Gold Power Supply, and all tests are run on Windows 11 Pro 21H2. So, with that out of the way, let's jump into those glorious benchmarks. Starting things off with 3D Mark Time Spy and a rough start here with one of our lower results, which is hardly a surprise given that this is the DDR4 version, but it is on par with the ASUS DDR4 motherboard, so in reality, it's all good. In PC Mark 10 Express, DDR4 or not, it's still got some legs with a score of 7,203 points, putting it just above the middle of our results, so things are looking much better. A fairly average but still very good score in SuperPi, again putting it on par with a few very good ASUS motherboards, which do typically cost more money. When it comes to rendering, the CPU is able to really hit those boost clocks and keep them there for a long time, resulting in our fastest Cinebench score we've seen on this chipset. Not bad for a DDR4 based motherboard really. In terms of memory testing, obviously it was going to perform lower than the other DDR5 based boards, but as you can see, it's actually outpacing the ASUS DDR4 motherboards, so again, top marks to MSI. Then with latency, as expected, it comes in line with the other DDR4 based boards, which all have superior latency to DDR5. So moving over to gaming, and it's hitting some pretty good numbers right out the gate, offering a fairly competitive 122 FPS with 89 FPS in the 1% lows in Cyberpunk. Horizon Zero Dawn saw the board nearing the top of our chart with 203 FPS average, and once again, really strong 1% lows, putting it above more expensive DDR5 based boards. In our next game, I was surprised to see Spider-Man on the lower end, but again, the 1% lows are still within a couple of FPS of each other, so the gameplay experience was still very smooth. In the grand scheme of things, the board was still a few FPS within kind of the realms of the other DDR4 based Z790 boards, so everything's good here. Then finally, in Microsoft Flight Sim, I thought that DDR4 may have been more of a limiting factor due to the game being so demanding, but as you can see, it's holding up just fine against the DDR5 based boards. So some pretty strong performance overall, especially given that it is a DDR4 based board, though it still managed to hold its own and showed that the board is well within the range we'd expect in comparison to other Z790 based boards. But with that not really telling us too much, it's time to look at an area that does make a difference, boot time. It's here where I'm not quite sure what to say as booting the system up into Windows with this board from a cold boot was on the slow side at just under 45 seconds, being the slowest Z790 board that we've tested, coming in slightly slower than the ASUS ROG Maximus Z790 Extreme, which is a fully feature packed board, hence why you'd kind of expect it to be quite slow anyway, while the Tomahawk is more of a mainstream board so you'd expect it to be quicker. Finally, the last big one comes down to VRM temperatures, and they are a little on the high end, but I'm typically happy so long as they stay under 80 degrees. There was clearly no sign of CPU performance being throttled either, so the board is well built to sustain these loads for a long period of time. Plus, this is after one hour of Prime 95, absolutely pummeling the CPU. And if you're a gamer, you're unlikely to ever really see temperatures push this hard, as CPUs have spikes in gaming, while during Prime 95, it's at maximum load for the whole hour. 
Now, typically with high-end VRMs, we normally see higher than normal power usage. And the total system power consumption is, again, high. But clearly that's resulting in some good CPU performance. And even with the warmer VRMs, it all seems to be working within reasonable tolerances. What this means for operating costs is that at load, it is a little more expensive to run than most, but the idles and more real world loads result in performance and cost similar to that of most of the others. It's a very similar story in the UK with idle cost being right in the mix with other boards, while load cost is a little higher, but only slightly above some of the competition from Gigabyte and Asus. So if you're wanting to buy a Z790 Tomahawk Wi-Fi DDR4, you'll be looking at around $275 in the US or $290 in the UK. However, if you want to spend a little more, you can get the DDR5 version instead, but keep in mind you will need some new memory if you're upgrading from an older platform. So where do I stand on it? Well, it's not a cheap motherboard, but it does have a lot of heat sinks and connectivity that are going to be worthy investments for more let's say enthusiast focused users. And I feel the Tomahawk as a range has stepped up its game a little. And of course that is reflected in the price. So being honest, I really do like this motherboard as it's got a really aggressive yet somehow understated aesthetic that should look great in virtually any high-end PC build. There's just a few niggly little things and like most motherboards, it comes down to the VRMs. Now, as aesthetically pleasing as it is, all those heat sinks are practical as well, ensuring that the huge amount of M.2 mounts can deliver better performance. Now for most gamers, this isn't going to matter that much, but if you're running a bunch of M.2 drives in RAID and, I don't know, dealing with some rendering projects, it could certainly pay off. So is this aimed more at those types of users or gamers, or maybe somewhere in the middle? What is interesting is that this motherboard comes in both DDR4 and DDR5 variants and that there's virtually no other difference between them. Most impressively, it was surprisingly competitive with DDR5 motherboards in most of our testing, especially when it comes to CPU heavy rendering tasks in gaming. However, there are a few more calculation based processes where faster memory can actually be an advantage. But if you're just, I don't know, cruising Reddit, playing CSGO and watching Netflix, then yeah, DDR4 will do just fine. The overall connectivity does push the price up somewhat on this motherboard. So unless you really need four M.2 slots, USB 3.2 Gen 2 and USB 3.2 Gen 2 by two, then a lower end model could actually save you a significant amount of money without compromising on the CPU performance. Those type C 20 gigabit per second ports alone do add a lot of cost. That being said, PCIe Gen 5, Gen 4 M.2, and the latest and greatest USB formats, along with what the chipset gives us through 2.5G LAN and Wi-Fi 6E, are all killer features for those who, I don't know, move around a lot of large files. So that's why I'm thinking maybe this is aimed more at those types of users. And I think this could really come down to personal preference based on your needs. With the DDR4 motherboard coming in a little cheaper, it is a great option for those wanting to upgrade as you can likely use your old memory kit on a newer motherboard. And the performance is clearly still very good. However, memory prices are extremely favorable right now. So I don't know, if you do upgrade, perhaps look at the DDR5 version anyway. It's kind of the best time, if any, to do it, right? Whichever you choose though, this is one of the best looking motherboards out there with really fantastic connectivity and competitive performance all around. And uh, yeah, that about wraps up this video. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you did, a like and a sub to the channel would be amazing. And if you love what we do, then consider supporting us over on Patreon, where you'll get access to tons of goodies, including exclusive behind the scenes content, super special area on Discord, some of our testing data and things like that as well, and much, much more. There's also an exclusive monthly live Q&A session. So there you have it. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys.